Good afternoon and welcome to the first Voices in Leadership series as we open our fall season. This is a series that focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the great pleasure to direct this program and to introduce our guest today. Our speaker has had a 40-year relationship with the Harvard School of Public Health. In a commencement address given here at the school in 2012, he stated, and I quote, graduates who go into the public health work will need more than tools of science and medicine to be effective. They will need to consider education, community building, mass media, social media legislation, and civic leadership. I speak of none other than Dr. Gerald Chan. Dr. Chan's career has not exactly been a linear one, but it is no doubt an extraordinary one. He has degrees in engineering from UCLA and a doctor of science in radiological physics from the Harvard School of Public Health. After graduating, he worked as a research fellow at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. In 1986, he and his brother Ronnie founded the Morningside Group, a diversified investment group engaged in private equity and venture capital investments. They invested in a range of real estate companies and development in China and the U.S., in fact, including much of Harvard Square. What is less well known, however, is the company's role in the life sciences area. These include biotech companies developing water filtration membranes, cancer targeting systems, a mobile app for early detection of autism, and full-length human DNA clones, among others. He serves on the boards of various universities and biotech companies in North America and Europe and is the chair of the Board of Overseers of the Morningside College of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Chan was inspired by his educational and scientific experience at the school, and this led him to see the significance of encouraging the school's work in the next century. It was this impression of the importance of the school's global mission that was the impetus for a $350 million gift to the school this past spring. To acknowledge this unprecedented gift, the Harvard School of Public Health was renamed the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. As former Dean Julio Frank has said, the Chan family's transformational gift will help us empower current and new generations of talented and diverse students and faculty to address the complex health threats change in the U.S. and the world. Although Dr. Chan is well known to many in many domains, he is considered to be a down-to-earth style leader who is most influential in the world of business and academia. As he discussed at the announcement of the Morningside Foundation's gift to the school, he was inspired by his mother's volunteer work vaccinating children in China in the 1950s and by the love and support for education of his father, T.H. Chan. Dr. Chan is an extraordinary leader and will share with us today his thoughts on leadership and innovation in the 21st century. Before I turn this session over to Dr. Bob Blendon, Senior Associate Dean for Policy Translation and Leadership Development here at the school, and who will conduct today's interview, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerald Chan to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Bob London. Uh, this is a special moment for us, and this interview is likely to be broadcast for students in decades into the future. So we're not only recognizing an incredible gift, which will help make this school play a huge global role in the future, but we're getting to know a very distinguished alumni. And so before we do, uh, we're getting to know him in an event that did not exist when he was a student. And that was the reason why we're having this event was because a later generation of students said that they wanted to know how people who were in major decision-making roles thought about those decisions. We never had this here. Uh, so essentially, he's coming back. Uh, this is the course he didn't take. Because uh, <laughs> it wasn't offered. offered right? <laughs> uh, for that, uh, Gerald and I have agreed we're going to ask, because I think this uh, interview is going to last a very long time, some very broad questions of him rather than specific. Uh, so the first, and we have students uh, from all over the world here, is um, uh, Gerald has played a role as a professional between two countries, uh, China 
uh, and the United States. And we run through this very, very quickly. But in case you missed, the two countries have different political systems, economies, <laughs> uh, cultures, way of making decisions. Make it worse for him, he grew up in Hong Kong, which had a British flavor uh, through a, a piece of that. And yet he's been able to have a career that moves back and forth and has an impact in both countries. Many people here today and watching want to have that type of career. So the first thing we agreed, we were going to ask him, are there lessons learned for people who are actually going to play leadership roles across borders? Well, I, I live, as the Chinese fortune cookie says, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> I certainly lived in very interesting times. Coming to America, or growing up in Hong Kong, coming to America in the 60s, when America was really at the top of the world, um, the height of the Cold War, the Vietnam War era, uh, and then things change. Uh, China became um, quite a powerful country, uh, itself, you know, having undergone a massive and profound transformation socially, economically, politically. Um, so my earlier years was filled with aspiration to come to America, you know, because America indeed was at the top of the world. And I was very fortunate to have come to America and then to benefit, you know, from a great education as here at the School of Public Health. But at another, and, and really, I mean, when, when I came to America, you know, I was just uh, uh, fully, you know, into the American culture. Um, and then I saw, I saw things, I saw the world changed, and I saw China, you know, developing. Now, the first people who went to China to invest were people who were, uh, who ran companies which needed cheap labor. And because of that necessity, you know, they were the first to uh, to, to enter China to access that cheap labor. But I never was involved in any of that. So for me to go to China was entirely voluntary and it was entirely based on a top-down decision, you know, uh, and it was a determination that China will become a major player in the world scene. It is an economy that is undergoing, you know, profound changes from the ground up and that I wanted to get in on the ground floor. And so in 1994, I in fact moved with my family. We left Boston and went to China. Uh, when I went to China, I tried my best to be uh, Chinese. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I'm fortunate, you know, to be facile in a couple of the Chinese dialects. But little did you know, you know, I actually bought, you know, these Chinese clothes, <laughs> uh, these Chinese shirts, <laughs> and I walk around. Nobody knew, you know, that um, uh, that I was any different from 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 they. And so, I think it's very important not only to be multilingual, but to be multicultural. And to be multicultural, you almost need to drop, you know, your native culture in order to pick up, you know, a new culture and to be able to have the facility, you know, to go back and forth. Uh, I think that cultural agility is, is really, really important. Then when it comes to operating businesses, you know, America has its way of operating, operating businesses. You know, China has its way of operating biz businesses. And America has its legal system. Um, um, uh, China has its own legal systems. I mean, every place is different. I mean, you have to adapt. Uh, not to say China and um, uh, America. Let me give you one example. Uh, between Massachusetts and Texas. <laughs> <laughs> the other country, Texas. <laughs> so, uh, I used to own some land uh, in, in, in Texas, outside of Dallas. And the school board said, uh, we're going to take your land, you know, to build a school. And being, you know, from liberal Massachusetts, said, you know, I got property rights. You know, um, let's, uh, I dare you, take it. <laughs> and I, I uh, went down there to, to Texas, 
And, you know, within a day, I said, you can have it. <laughs> 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 Texas justice is a bit different from Massachusetts justice. <laughs> so you have to be uh, adept uh, wherever you are. Uh, whatever culture, whatever setting, whatever system you operate in, you know, you have to be, you know, willing, you know, to go with the flow and... But what's important is never sacrifice your principles. Never sacrifice your moral compass. Uh, I know a lot of people talk about China, you know, oh, to do things you've got to bribe people. You know, I tell you, I never had to do that. Uh, there are things in life that you have to hold on to. Uh, there are things in life that you have to be uh, uh, agile ab about. So I think it's important, you know, for all the students to have that sense of awareness of what are the invariants in life that I will not change, I will not compromise, I will not give up. And then, you know, how do I become effective? All right. The, uh uh, walking through the halls of the last two days, students take me aside and say, will you ask him how he went from science to becoming one of the world's big investors? What did you take with you and what changed? But uh, most of us who are, did graduate work in science don't instantly see our last seminar <laughs> leading to exactly what you're now doing. So what did you keep with you? What changed? What did it feel like to leave your comfort zone of having been a research scientist? So, so I did my, after the School of Public Health, I did my postdoc at, um, uh, at the, at the Dana-Farber, and those were the early days of recombinant DNA. So I was working with some uh, sequencing DNA stuff. And um, so I was working with this little Eppendorf tube with a drop of colorless liquid at the bottom of it, you know, a few microliters. And um, that was my life. And running gels and said, hmm, life has got to be more than just this drop of colorless liquid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was a sense of it was a sense of alienation, uh, um, but the the point I, I really would like to make is this: that nowadays, graduate education, unfortunately, uh, has a tendency of pushing students to be narrower and narrower. You know, I mean, your colorless liquid is your future to a job, <laughs> huh? um, and. And it has to be vertical, narrow, because you have to be very good at whatever that thing is. And the funding mechanism, you know, also, you know, push people to become narrow and narrow. Um, I feel very fortunate that in my time here in the School of Public Health, that I had the liberty to just roam the intellectual landscape and I took the liberty primarily to roam the scientific landscape. And I regret that I did not take the opportunity to roam the landscape of the humanities and the social sciences. Today, I read you know, books written by famous professors uh, who taught at Harvard. I could have been in their classes. <laughs> and you know, which I didn't. Nobody told me to. Nobody uh, enlightened me. You know. It doesn't mean you know I had to take it for credit, but at least sit in there and listen to the you know man talk about you know something. So uh, for for me, you know, I I feel from science to business uh, almost means from something very narrow to something very broad. Now life, you know, we all have to find our own journey. I don't know what boats you know for you in the future. But it would do. Um, it, it, it would prepare you well if you build a broad foundation in life, um, whether it be your field or fields other than your field. <laughs> I strongly encourage you students to avail yourself of the richness of, of the whole university, and don't stay in your comfort zone. Um, a corollary to that is I really believe in required courses. I think, I think there should be required <coughs> courses, you know, for every uh, curriculum. Um, 
One time I talked to some students uh, from Johns Hopkins, and they said, what's one question, what's the course that helped you the most in life? What was the course? And I said it was epidemiology. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You know, because epi epidemiology pre prepare me or train me to look at the world as cause and effect and, you know, to uh, weed out all the confounding variables mm -hmm. and get down to, you know, um, what really, you know, uh, can drive, you know, the outcome. Um, and epidemiology, studying diseases, uh, at the population level, you are studying a subject matter that is inherently heterogeneous and unstable. As opposed to, you know, doing science, you know, when you do that experiment, that every time that enzyme works that way, you know, on that substrate with that kind of kinetics. Mm -hmm. uh, so why did I take epidemiology? <laughs> because it was required. <laughs> <laughs> if it was up to me, Michelle, would I have taken epidemiology? <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> I'm a big believer in required courses. But even if your curriculum doesn't require of you, you should require of yourself. Um, and I know time is limited. You only have, you know, one or three or four years in the school. I, I think a great thing is just to go audit. You don't have to take it for credit. Just go sit in there, tell the professor, you know, you're a student, you know, it, whatever program that, you know, this is not, you know, the mainstream of what I do, but I really would like to uh, learn, you know, what you're teaching. So uh, the next question, and the answer can be epidemiology, <laughs> uh, is uh, in uh, your uh, new role, basically you invest in the future in biotechnology. Some of these things work out, some don't. The problem is the future has uncertainty. What skills do you bring to make those decisions? Many of us are very uncomfortable with uncertainty. Unless I have the data all laid out, I don't exactly know what to do, and yet you're in a field where uh, that's there. So what do you use? So, so I, I operate, in even in the investment business, at the end of the spectrum where there is the greatest uncertainty. Uh, you know, if I was a Warren Buffett type investor, you know, I can look at financial statements, you know, uh, what's the uh, uh, profit margin, what's the growth of sales, you know, uh, what's the market share, uh, what's the price earning ratio, you know, there's stuff to analyze. But, you know, I'm in the venture capital business, which is the business of creating something that doesn't exist, right? Um, what what is the what what is this going to look like? You know, it doesn't exist. So, I come back to this same point that I just made. You have to build a broad foundation for yourself. Um, I see even in the biotech business, people who work on uh, oncology. You know, they only you know. Uh, work on and, and look at the problem, you know, as a problem of uh, chemotherapy, you know? Um, because, you know, that, that, that's the narrow base that they have to work with. Um, well, these are the people who will miss out on the big uh, um, breakthroughs. Analysis, which presupposes data, you know, to analyze, I'm not saying that it's not useful, but it is most useful in incremental uh, actions or steps. Um, here's a set of data. You can analyze that. What's the next step? Talk about big breakthroughs. Chances are that it is not based on data that you can analyze. So for me, um, I, I'll tell you this way without, you know, hopefully offending you. It comes down to a gut feeling. But by gut feeling, I don't mean, you know, I don't mean that. My gut feeling today is the distillation, 
the culmination of my whole life of learning, observing, uh, doing, you know, my successes, my failures, you know, my watching others do, do what they do. All of that ultimately distills to a, for lack of a better word, a gut feeling. <laughs> So without being derogatory, I know some high-minded academic would say, oh, you know, you come here to tell the students to follow the gut feeling. Come on, you know. <laughs> they don't need to go to Harvard for that. <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, going to Harvard will actually improve your gut feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, everything has to be distilled, you know, to a judgment because you don't know the, f the future. And because you don't know the future, you have to take risk. So risk taking and that risk tolerance is also very important. We have a couple online questions that we obtained ahead of time. Betty? Yes, thank you, Dr. Chan. The first question is, summarize for students watching what you see as critical stepping stones leading to your current success. Uh, <laughs> you stunned me. <laughs> The critical steps that, um, gosh, I don't know. Um, and, and, and let me respond this way. A um, lot of people think that my life, they only see where I am today, and they thought that my life was a prescribed path, mm -hmm. you know, that I was there and now I'm here. Mm -hmm. And somehow when I was there, I had a grand plan and I had all the steps laid out. Uh, let me tell you, let me once and for all, you know, uh, destroy that illusion. I tell you, when I was there, I had no idea where I was going to end up. <laughs> and, and along the way, you know, I made a number of choices. Uh, every choice that I made, did I know that that would lead me to where I am today? I don't think so. Life is a series of serendipity. Uh, I encourage all of you to uh, give more breathing room, you know, to your life and your decision making, uh, and not be so prescriptive, either by yourself or, in the case of some students, by the parents. You know, mm -hmm. that the parents say, you know, you're going to be a doctor because the parents want you to be a doctor, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or you're going to be an investment banker, you know, because the daddy wants you to be an investment banker. Uh, no, you know, allow yourself the flexibility, the breathing room, respond, you know, to the choice in front of you, and grand plans uh, only, or only make sense when you look back. <laughs> Prospectively, it is one step at a time. We have one more. One more question, thank you. Referencing your, 20, your 2012 commencement address, you spoke about uh, students being interested in public health work, needing to have more than science and medicine. They needed some additional tools. Can you expound upon what those additional tools might be? Well, I said, you know, in the speech, you know, uh, and you, you read some of it, uh, but, but, you know, you don't know what you will need to do, you know, uh, or you will do in the future. And therefore, how do you know what are the tools? I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't tell you what are the tools, you know. Uh, I, I, I can only say, you know, be curious, always be learning. Uh, somebody said, a colleague of mine said to me yesterday, she said, I've never met a person who is so eager to learn as you. And she has worked with me for 20 some years. So she's watched me. And uh, I'm always learning. Um, to this day, I'm always learning. The younger guys are trying to keep up with me, um, I, and, and, and they have a hard time. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just feel, you know, you don't know the future. So uh, avail yourself, you know, of every opportunity. Uh, learn, experience, you know, whatever uh, that seems or that is available to you at the time and seems appealing to you. Uh, in retrospect, at some point in your life, you will look back and say, it all makes sense. Uh, one other quick question. When you were speaking at the uh, Johns Hopkins China American Center in Nanjing, you talked about uh, 
uh, the last American generation becoming too self-focused and not focusing on broader issues. In sort of closing here, what did you mean by that and what do you have advice for the next generation here? Well, I was referring to, you know, uh, if you look at my generation, you know, look at, uh, speaking of America, you know, look at the national debt, you know, when we were young versus today. What does that mean? You know, that means you guys, the younger guys, you're going to pay for us, you know. Uh, all the uh, debt that we incur, you know, the next future generations have to bear their burden. Um, I do see a change, you know, and I think a sea change today. I mean, the fact that you all, you know, have come to the School of Public Health and talking to the students here, I'm just struck and, you know, how much, you know, you are desirous of having social impact, having positive, you know, impact on, on, on society. Uh, so I, I'm really happy to, to see, you know, that that is the atmosphere of this school and I hope, you know, that the school will continue, you know, to foster um, this sort of aspiration uh, so that our students would go forward from this school and um, have positive impact. Now, of course, I mean, we all have to take care of ourselves and family. I think everything will sort itself out. Can we out. close with that advice for you? <laughs> and that is basically what will be the legend and history of the beginning of the second phase here. Thanks again very much, Gerald. Thank you, Bob. Yes. And I'd like to say for the online audience, our next Voices and Leadership series webcast is Tuesday, September the 22nd from 12.30 to 1.30 with Dr. Howard Coe. You will not want to miss this session. Thank you. <laughs>